You just shot an unarmed man. Well, he should have armed himself. He's going to decorate his saloon with my friend. You'd be William Money out of Missouri. The Wild West has always fascinated me. Ever since I can remember, I have tried to imagine how life was back then. So I prepared some videos to give you a glimpse. Join us as we look at 15 unusual things that took place in the wild, wild west. Frenchman's Gulch. This town is new to me. Number 15. Ghost Towns and Their Unexpected Origins Though there are some truly terrifying haunted hotels out there, ghost towns are almost as terrifying. The abandoned cities can be found all over America and are said to be extremely haunting. They weren't always like this. Most of them were formerly thriving mining towns teeming with people hoping to strike gold or silver. Many have been unchanged for almost a century and yet a plethora of old structures have survived. If you're bold enough, you can visit ghost towns all around the United States. It can be found in states such as Pennsylvania, Wyoming, Montana, Alaska, New Mexico, New York, West Virginia, and others. Not all of them are said to be haunted, but some do have ghosts of former business owners or people roaming the general stores or old jails. Not all of them, however, are completely defunct. One even has an internationally acclaimed restaurant, according to reports. Just make sure you're adequately equipped when you visit any of these abandoned and haunted towns. But then again, ghosts are immune to everything. Number 14. Deadly Poker Games – The Origins of Dead Man's Hand The most frequently held view is that poker evolved from the French game Poc. When French sailors arrived in New Orleans with their goods in the 1800s, they carried the game with them and it spread along the Mississippi. By the mid-1800s, a regular 52-card deck had replaced the original 20-card deck that Pock demanded, and the rules had been changed and the name anglicized to poker. The game rose in popularity during the 19th century as the western frontier spread, and it was usual for the game to be played for money. The game spread further during the Civil War and the Great Gold Rush, and the Wild West saw the advent of all kinds of players. Cheating, hustling, gambling, and violence became associated with the game. Famous poker players like Doc Holliday, Wild Bill Hickok, and Pat Garrett are inextricably tied with the Wild West saloons. What is now known as the Dead Man's Hand Card combination got its name from a tale that it was the five-card stud or five-card draw hand held by Wild Bill Hickok when he was shot in the back of the head on August 2, 1876 by Jack McCall. Hickok's final hand allegedly contained aces and eights from both black suits. According to Carl W. Brennan's book, the cards were collected from the floor by a guy named Neil Christie, who subsequently handed them on to his son. The son, in turn, informed Mr. Brennan about the hand's makeup. Christie's son revealed the actual identities of these cards to him, the ace of diamonds with a heel mark on it, the ace of clubs, the two black eights, clubs and spades, and the queen of hearts with a small drop of Hickok's blood on it. Despite, nothing of the sort was recorded immediately after the shooting. Number 13. The Camel Corpse – America's Desert Experiment As Americans moved into the Wild West, the U.S. military met several unique issues. Although battles with Native Americans, outlaws, and the Mexican-American War were well known, there was another major issue, particularly in the Southwest. The environment proved lethal for horses and mules, which had traditionally been used to transport soldiers and supplies. When the United States won the Mexican-American War, the country gained hundreds of thousands of miles of desert. Because much of this territory was near the Mexican border, it had to be guarded. Jefferson Davis, a United States senator, rose to the occasion with a novel suggestion. He believed that the United States should import an exotic animal from the Middle East known as a camel. Jefferson Davis collaborated with the temporary commander of the Department of Texas, none other than Robert E. Lee, to achieve this purpose. Some camels were purchased and tested, but the camel corpse was never meant to be because everyone had more vital things to focus on after the war began. With the advent of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, the camel was effectively rendered obsolete after the war. The surviving camels were either sold to private parties or abandoned. Many of them found their way into circuses where they amused audiences for decades. 
Number 12. The Greenhorn, Easterners in the Wild West A greenhorn or a pilgrim is an Easterner who has not been educated in the ways of the West. Some believe the name was first attributed to Eastern cattle, whose feet were more delicate than longhorn cattle, and then to humans fresh to the West. Adolescent male oxen or bulls with immature horns were frequently boastful, brash, and overconfident. They were unaware of their own limitations. And no, they didn't have green horns. They were simply not right. Newcomers to the Old West were frequently misbehaving like adolescent bulls. They were overzealous and inexperienced, a potentially dangerous mix in the Wild West. These newcomers reminded cattle ranchers of brash young bulls, so they gave them the nickname Greenhorns. Number 11. The Mysterious Disappearance of Tombstone Silver The finding of silver in southern Arizona quickly became known, attracting hundreds of prospectors, speculators, businessmen, homesteaders, gunmen, and lawyers, among others. Early in 1879, a settlement was established on flat land near the mines. It was originally called Goose Flats, but the name was changed to Tombstone after the first silver claim in the area. By the mid-1880s, the town had grown fast and had a population of around 15,000 people. Following subsequent discoveries in the vicinity, a mineral belt was formed that spanned about 5 miles north and south of the town and about 8 miles west and east. Although Ed's discoveries sparked a flurry of mining activity in the area, it was not the region's first silver discovery. As the mines ran out of usable ore, they were forced to close or declare bankruptcy one by one. Tombstone, like everything else in the world, would finally come to an end. By the end of 1893, all silver production in Tombstone had ceased and the mines had been closed. Number 10. Women of the West – More Than Just Damsels in Distress Calamity Jane, Bell Star, and Pearl Hart. With firearms in hand, these Wild West women challenged the notion that life as a female pioneer was all about cooking, sewing, cleaning, and caring for children. These trailblazers were born during a time when women were expected to be as good as, if not better, than rough male counterparts. Some of them became outlaw legends, startling society with their harsh and uncouth actions. His fierce, rebellious persona was personified by Martha Calamity Jane Canary. She disguised herself as a guy to get ahead, hard drinking, gun slinging, and bragging about her adventures. She defied the customary female role when she traveled to the West with her parents at the age of 13, spending much of her time with men and joining hunting groups. Annie Oakley, who was also famous in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, had incredible proficiency with a gun and carved out a career for herself that many did not believe a woman could have. Unlike outlaws Pearl Hart and Bell Star, Calamity Jane and Annie Oakley never used their guns as a threat. Pearl Hart was inspired by the strong ladies of the West, especially Annie Oakley, who she fell in love with after witnessing her perform. Hart traveled to Arizona, leaving her children at home in Canada, quickly found herself involved in criminal activity as a solution to her financial problems. The most famous bandit queen was Belle Starr, whose relationship with Jesse James and the younger brothers, as well as her vast record of illicit behavior, made her one of the Wild West's most prominent female outlaws. These women's extraordinary stories became folklore, their exploits idealized and embellished in dime novels and later in the musical and movie picture industries. Though the boundary between reality and fiction is often hazy and difficult to distinguish, one thing is certain, these women of the Wild West were pioneers, defying established roles of women in the 19th century. Number 9. The Hanging Judge – Isaac Parker's Ruthless Courtroom Isaac Charles Parker, often known as Hanging Judge Parker, was a politician and jurist in the United States. He was the first United States District Judge of the United States District Court for the Western District of Arkansas, which also held authority over Indian Territory after serving as a United States representative from Missouri. Parker became renowned as the hanging judge of the American Old West because he executed many inmates. Judge Parker tried 13,490 cases over his 21 years on the federal bench. In over 8,500 of these cases, the offender pleaded guilty or was found guilty at trial. Parker sentenced 160 people to death, 79 were hung, while the remaining 81 died in prison were pardoned or had their sentences reduced. Number 8. The Great Train Robbery That Wasn't 
spoiled plans and misadventures. Train robberies were a uniquely American crime that was rarely seen in other countries. Although several robberies occurred in Canada, Mexico, and South America, most of these crimes were assumed to have been committed by Americans. Following the initial wave of post-Civil War robberies, the number swiftly increased to a peak in 1893 and 1894. Robberies decreased in frequency after then and had nearly disappeared by 1930. During the years following the Civil War, most of the country experienced unemployment and lawlessness, giving rise to several infamous desperados and bandit groups. The Reno Gang from Indiana began terrorizing the Midwest about this time. On October 6, 1866, the Reno brothers boarded an eastbound Ohio and Mississippi Railroad passenger train near Seymour, Indiana, and entered an Adams Express Company car committing one of America's earliest train robberies. They then emptied one safe and flung another out the window while wearing masks and carrying firearms before jumping off the train and making an easy getaway. The Pinkerton National Detective Agency quickly apprehended the perpetrators, but the crime kicked off a lengthy and lethal era of rail robberies in the United States. Following the Seymour incident, there was a rash of railroad robberies. Two trains derailed within weeks and their payroll cars were robbed. Train robberies resulted in significant loss of life and damage as well as disruptions to public transit and the movement of people and goods across the United States. Because many trains were derailed as part of the robbery or cars were occasionally blown with dynamite, human injury and mortality rates were sometimes severe. The successful abolition of these infractions not only stabilized rail transportation, but also signified the beginning of the taming of the Wild West. Number 7. Mining for Gold with Vegetables – The Potato Patch Claim Washington state isn't recognized for producing huge gold nuggets. In fact, when compared to practically all the western states in the United States, it is perhaps the worst state for trying to find huge gold nuggets. However, there is one location in Washington that has a long history of generating beautiful gold nuggets and that is the mining town of Liberty. The richest gold-bearing areas near Liberty were discovered north of Ellensburg in Swak and Williams Creek. The first discoveries in the Swak district were discovered in 1873, and unlike most other locations that yielded only fine gold dust and flakes, huge nuggets were often found. Most placer deposits have long since been depleted, but not all. On Corbley's potato patch claim in Liberty, some miners were prospecting the bedrock of a historic river channel in the fall of 2013. Earlier in the day, a prospector was swinging a metal detector over the bedrock and had some success discovering some tiny gold nuggets. Heavy machinery was employed to clear much of the dirt and overburden, exposing the bedrock and letting the prospector to operate his detector over top of it. They had been mining in this area for many years and there had been undoubtedly some good gold nuggets discovered. Several multi-ounce nuggets have been discovered on his claim throughout the years, including one weighing more than five ounces a few years ago. What they uncovered, however, was beyond anyone's greatest dreams. The metal detector produced a booming signal, indicating the presence of a massive piece of iron garbage. This type of thing is prevalent in mining regions, and finding rusty rubbish with a metal detector is not uncommon. The fact that it was discovered in such deep depths that had only lately been revealed was unexpected. What they expected to be iron turned out to be something very different. The prospector discovered a 16.25 troy ounce gold nugget that was smooth and spherical like a golden potato. And if it wasn't amazing enough, another 13 ouncer was discovered only a few feet away. Both nuggets were smooth and iron tainted, indicating that they had been at the bottom of the river at one time. They tumbled around on the bedrock for millions of years, forming their smooth and spherical shapes. The river channel changed locations, was chopped down, and somehow left an ancient river channel high and dry. These two magnificent nuggets had been there for millions of years before being discovered. Any gold miner would consider these beauties to be a once-in-a-lifetime find. Number 6. The Gunfight at OK Corral – Myths and Misunderstandings the gunfight at the OK Corral was a 30-second gunfight between lawmen commanded by Virgil Earp and members of a loosely organized group of criminals known as the Cowboys that took place in Tombstone, Arizona on Wednesday, October 26, 1881. It is widely recognized as the most famous firefight in American Old West history. The gunfight was the culmination of a long-running dispute. On one side were Cowboys Billy Claiborne, brothers Ike and Billy Clanton, 
and brothers Tom and Frank McClory. Virgil Erb, Deputy U.S. Marshal and Town Marshal, is two brothers, Special Policeman Morgan and Wyatt Erb, and Temporary Policeman Doc Holliday were on the other side. Both Billy Clanton and the McClory brothers were assassinated. Ike Clanton and Billy Claiborne fled the brawl. Virgil, Morgan, and Holiday were all injured, but Wyatt escaped unscathed. Wyatt is frequently mistakenly considered as the primary figure in the shootout, even though his brother Virgil was Tombstone's town marshal and deputy U.S. marshal that day and had considerably more fighting experience as a sheriff, constable, marshal, and soldier. Virgil decided to enforce a city rule that prohibited carrying guns in town and disarmed the cowboys. Wyatt was simply his brother's temporary assistant marshal. The gunfight did not take place within or near the OK Corral, despite its name. The shooting took place in a small yard on Fremont Street, six doors west of the OK Corral's back entrance. Many of the sources recounting the circumstances leading up to the gunfight, as well as the details of the gunfight, contradict each other. According to the Herb's version of events, the fight was in self-defense because the cowboys, who were armed in violation of local code, refused to comply with a valid request to surrender their guns and instead drew their pistols. The cowboys said that the Herbs shot them in cold blood after they raised their hands and offered no resistance. Sorting out who was telling the truth was difficult back then, and it still is today. Number 5. The Unsung African-American Boy of the West Though Hollywood has whitewashed the Wild West in many ways, some of the early settlers were emancipated slaves who journeyed west and became the American frontier's black cowboys. Following the Civil War and Reconstruction, America focused on colonizing regions in the Great Plains and West. Despite what you may have seen in movies, the American West was largely established by freed slaves. In the 1870s and 1880s, black cowboys made up as much as 25% of the Old West's 35,000 cowboys. Slaves who had been freed traveled west to seek their fortunes among cattle ranchers and rows of crops. As slaves, blacks oversaw crops and cows for their white owners, and the availability of land provided a new avenue for them to flee the South. Bass Reeves became a United States Marshal in 1875, supervising the enormous expanse of Oklahoma Territory before it became a state. His work was difficult. 130 of the 200 marshals slain in the course of duty were killed in Oklahoma. That didn't stop the former slave from fleeing to Arkansas. Because of his time fighting in Oklahoma Territory during the Civil War, he was an outstanding marksman with a rifle and pistol. Reeves' story is thought to be the inspiration for the Lone Ranger stories, since Reeves kept his identity hidden and had a Native American sidekick. Bill Pickett was a skilled ranch worker who was born in Texas around 1870. He devised bulldogging, a method of subduing animals by biting their lips. Pickett watched bulldogs biting their lips and dragging livestock to the ground until the cows remained motionless. Before migrating to West Texas, Bob Lemons was a slave. This terrain was home to vast herds of wild mustangs, which were in high demand by ranchers arriving in the Wild West. His unusual method began with gaining the herd's trust. He accomplished this by working alone rather than in a group, as many men would frighten the herd. Lemons broke the lead horse after infiltrating the herd of wild mustangs. The horses would all follow the leader back to his pasture. Lemons' lucrative profession enabled him to save enough money to buy his own ranch and stock it with horses and livestock. He died at the age of 99 in 1947. Number 4. Chinese Laborers and the Building of the West the Transcontinental Railroad was an engineering triumph of human endurance, with the western segment built mostly by thousands of Chinese immigrant laborers. Thousands of migrant workers, including Chinese, Irish, and Mormons, contributed to the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. Chinese immigrants were especially important in the construction of railroads in the American West, and as Chinese laborers became successful in the United States, many of them became entrepreneurs. Most of the labor between Sacramento, California, and Promontory, Utah, was made up of Chinese workers. More than 2.5 million Chinese citizens left their nation during the 19th century and were hired in 1864 when a labor shortage threatened the railroad's completion. Number 3. Dentistry on Horseback – The Roving Tooth Pullers I frequently hear people comment that they wish they had lived in the good old days, and I say it myself. The good old days weren't all that bad. I usually respond, trained dentists did not exist until the 1800s, and prior to that, the nation's mouths 
were cared for by blacksmiths and barbers who also served as surgeons. They brandished pliers for pulling teeth or bottle opener-like gadgets that relied on the helpless patient's jaw for leverage, like something out of the Spanish Inquisition. It was not uncommon to mistakenly dislocate the patient's jaw during a procedure. For hundreds of years, the profession was a back-alley horror show run by ham-fisted amateurs who were guaranteed to leave their patients in agony if they survived. The arrival of cheap sugar from the West Indies in the mid-1600s resulted in an increase in tooth decay. Until the middle of the 19th century, extraction was nearly the only treatment available for a toothache, and it was not something to look forward to. Thousands of people died because of poor medical care, infections, and other problems. So, it's hardly unexpected that the dentist's chair was regarded with dread. Teeth transplantation from the dead to the living was popular in the 18th century, believe it or not. Grave thieves converging on battlefields may make a modest profit by extracting teeth from the dead and selling them for use as transplants. If one was lucky, he may get a shot of whiskey to ease the pain, but otherwise, all he got was a prayer. Until recently, erotic and neglected teeth were a common occurrence. The advent of the mass-produced toothbrush in 1780 ate it, but it was too expensive for the poor and was frequently referred to as a community toothbrush. Dentistry was still so expensive in the early 20th century that some people elected to have all their teeth extracted to save a lifetime of misery. Having all your teeth extracted was thought to be the ideal gift for a 21st birthday or a newly married woman. Number 2. The Big Nose George Parrot Myths and legends abound throughout American folklore. Everyone has heard about Paul Bunyan and John Henry. But have you ever heard of Big Nose George? Warden George Francis, a.k.a. Huge Nose, in the 1800s, George was a horse thief and rail robber. George and his crew were busy in the Powder River Valley robbing pay wagons and cash shipments and stealing passengers' money and jewels. They planned to derail and then rob a train one day in 1878. The train company's section crew had ridden ahead to inspect the tracks. After witnessing what the bandits had done, the crew was able to stop the train, repair the tracks, and go about their job without incident. George escaped and fled to commit crime somewhere else, but his mouth was as huge as his nose. George was apprehended and sentenced to death after bragging about his exploits. George's execution date had been set, but he had no desire to be executed by the state. He attempted to flee and fought and critically injured one of his jailers in the process. As an unskilled criminal, his escape attempt was swiftly thwarted, and he was dragged back into his cell at gunpoint. When locals learned of the disturbance he was causing, they decided to take matters into their own hands and lynch George rather than wait for the authorities. The enraged mob was about as proficient as lynching as George was at crime. The first two attempts to hang him were botched, but the third time was the charm, and George was soon swinging from a telegraph pole. George was most likely dead after hanging up for a few hours. The undertaker carried him down and buried him. However, according to folklore, his nose was so big that it interfered with the lid on the coffin. Excessive power was required to close the lid, which had to be nailed shut. Number 1. Two Graves for One Man You've probably heard at least some of the legends of Wild West outlaw Jesse James, how he robbed trains and banks while battling Pinkertons. What have you ever heard of the bizarre account of how he was buried three times in Missouri in two distinct locations? To deter grave thieves, James was initially buried in his mother's yard. James' original grave was on his family's land, but he was eventually relocated to Kearney Cemetery. The original footstone remains, but the family replaced the headstone. The following epitaph was written for James by his mother, Zerelda Samuel, in loving memory of my beloved son murdered by a traitor and coward whose name is not worthy to appear here. Zerelda Mims James, James' widow, died alone and in poverty. Rumors about Jesse James' survival spread almost as quickly as his death was declared in the press. Some speculated that Robert Ford killed someone other than James in an intricate scheme to avoid prosecution. These stories were never taken seriously, either back then or afterwards. Even though the Wild West has always fascinated me, I don't think I would have enjoyed living during that era. What about you? Why don't you let us know in the comments below? Well, that's it for now. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a like and let us know in the comments what you think. Check out our other videos and subscribe to be part of the fun. Click on the notification icon so you can see our new videos as soon as they're uploaded. Thanks for watching and see you next time.